Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing why each year, one in 10 Americans aged 18 to 25 experience some form of homelessness. That's 10% of Americans, and our special guests today are experts in addressing youth homelessness, a problem that affects every part of this country. I'd like to introduce Anne Oliva, uh, Executive Director of the National Alliance to End Homelessness, which is based in Washington, D.C. Renisha Robinson, Executive Director of Covenant House in New Orleans, Louisiana, and Sherilyn Adams, Executive Director of the Larkin Street Youth Services in San Francisco, California. So thank you all for joining us. It's just wonderful to see you. I hope you're preparing for a, a wonderful holiday season. Uh, but we're here to talk about something very, very serious today. And and as I noted in, in our introduction, each year we have one in 10, that's 10% of American youth between the ages of 18 and 25 uh, experience uh, some form of homelessness and even uh, younger children, uh, 13 to 17, um, one in 30 adolescents experience homelessness without a parent or guardian uh, present. That's That's just huge. And we're such a a wealthy, well put together uh, nation. We live generally within our borders in a fairly uh, peaceful environment. The real question is, why do we have 4.2 million youth and young adults, of which 700,000 are unaccompanied minors? Why do we have that, Anne, in this, in this country today? What, what what are your observations as to why we have so much homelessness among young people? Thank you so much, Mark, uh, for that question and for having me. Good day, everybody. It's nice to be here with my colleagues from uh, New Orleans and from San Francisco. Uh, so I, I think it's important to just sort of establish what what the volume is. You you gave some some data there. I would also just remind folks that unaccompanied youth uh, experience homelessness both, well, youth experience homelessness both as unaccompanied people, but also as heads of household. So uh, in January of 2020, we're going to just take a snapshot of a single day um, in January of 2020, which is our most re recent point in time count data, uh, about a little over 34,000 young people were experiencing unaccompanied uh, youth homelessness in the United States. And then another uh, 7,300 young people were experiencing homelessness as parents with at least one child under the age of 18 with them. Could you repeat those two numbers? Sure. Um, a little more than 34,000 uh, young people were unaccompanied and reporting uh, to be were reported to be experiencing homelessness in the United States on a single night in January of 2020. That is not a whole year's worth of data. It is a snapshot of what's happening um, on a, uh, again on that single night. On and, that cold day in January, right. 34,000, and then an additional over 7,000. That's right. Over 7,300 young people were experiencing homelessness as parents with a child under the age of 18 with them. Um, about 90% of unaccompanied homeless young people were between the ages, as you mentioned, of 18 and 24, and the other 10% were children, that is under the age of, of 18. And about half of the unaccompanied um, young people were unsheltered. So that's a that's similar to what we see with individuals uh, with adult individuals who are experiencing homelessness. So about half were unsheltered and half were were in sheltered na nationwide. Unsheltered meaning living in cars on the street in tents in boxes. That's what we're talking about. Right. We we use the terminology places not meant for human habitation. So there are also. Um, a number of young people that were in precarious housing situations. I'm sure my colleagues uh, will be talking a little bit more in detail about that. But this point in time count just gives you an idea of folks who are experiencing um, sort of unsheltered and sheltered homelessness on that single night. And then the other thing that I just want to note uh, for the audience here is that this is not just about uh, urban areas. It is really also about suburban and rural areas. And we know 
from the work of our colleagues at Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago, that the rates of youth experiencing homelessness are about the same in rural and uh, non-rural areas. So, so let me is- stop you there. So, so as soon as you go beyond the raw numbers and you start looking at it on a per capita basis, in other words, that takes into account concentrations of populations and thinly populated areas on a per capita basis, we're talking about the same problem throughout the United States, regardless to whether we're talking about a suburb or an urban uh, this you know, city center area or a rural area on a per capita basis, those numbers are fairly similar. That's right. That's exactly right. I'll stop there. That's the, the nationwide picture of what we're seeing. So this is this is so very important. Can we drill down uh, to New Orleans? What your experience here, uh, you know, in, in your area of the world, um, Renisha, um, what is from from that level, right? From from that sort of local and regional level, are d- does does what you see conform to what Anne described? Yes, absolutely. Um, we we see about 160 youth in our various residential programs um, on our census daily. So that um, sort of equates to about 700 youth that we interact with um, in in a, a given year. Um, and those are young people that seek our services through um, our residential programs, whether they're here for a night. Um, just needing basic needs met, um, a hot shower, a hot meal, um, or they need more long-term um, shelter services, uh, transitional services, and other su- supportive services. Um, we in- interact with young people on the street, um, but more commonly, young people are coming into our open intake shelter seeking resources, um, and they're a more likely uh not unsheltered. Um, they may be couch surfing. They may be um, living with family member to family member until quite often they they reach um, the age of 18. Maybe they are no longer eligible for services through foster care and they are seeking shelter um, or they've kind of run out of the available resources that they may have um, within their family units. And so they seek um, services, but most commonly about 85% of the youth that we engage with are seeking some sort of residential support service um, when they come to our doors. So I think that is um, very uh, in line with what Anne um, gave us as the national picture. We're seeing that in, in our um, kind of urban metro area, uh, but we also in, in a you know, place like the South with um, very few resources, um, we're seeing youth coming to us from a four-state region. Well, I I think that's really also very important, right? When you have a a, um, a, uh, region of the country where systematic support is not so readily available, the places where it is provided, like a city like uh, New Orleans, where the support, even if it's inadequate, is more systematically provided, that becomes a magnet for those people who have no other choice, right? So, so you end up having in a in a relatively contained uh, city, you end up having to function as a safety net for a much broader area. And when you're when you're saying uh, a a, a uh, area, can we define that a little bit? Is it just Louisiana, or are people coming from out of state also to New Orleans? So people come from all over the country, actually. I think New Orleans is an attractive place for for a lot of people. Um, And, you know, more specifically for youth um, who are seeking um, seeking our services. New Orleans is very attractive. So we get young people from all over the country. Um, But more commonly, we're getting young people from the metro area, um, other parts of the Louisiana, the state of Louisiana, and we also get young people commonly from Alabama, Arkansas, and Mississippi as well. And Sherilyn, you also have a, a um, an interesting situation. Um, like New Orleans, um, San Francisco also is a tourist town. There's a lot of 
a lot of people who come and go. There's wealth that comes into the city. There are restaurants. There's there, there's there are jobs that that uh, can be acquired by people of, of particular skill sets. Um, but you also have this this incredible issue, like in New Orleans, where you have young people living in poverty who are housing uh, insecure. Um, permeating the city. What is your picture from Larkin Street's perspective? Hi, all. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's great to see Anne and Renisha. Um, it's been a very long time. Uh, uh, so thanks for the question. Yeah, I mean, I think partly when we think about young people experiencing homelessness or housing instability, common causes like uh, Anne and Renisha highlighted have to do with inadequate support maybe at home, financial or economic issues for families or others that there's simply just not an, you know, a lack of affordability in San Francisco. Obviously we have high housing costs. We have a highly skilled labor, labor market, making it very difficult to be able to, to, to survive in the city or to find and keep housing in the city. So young people might be experiencing homelessness because of uh, abuse or neglect in the home, because of aging out of systems, foster care systems or others and having inadequate support. Uh, we see many young people who just can't make it work financially, right? They just can't get a job that's going to pay for the rent. Um, and of course, we have long standing issues around structural racism, homophobia, all of which drives youth of color, LGBTQ youth into homelessness at far greater rates uh, than, than white cisgendered youth. And so I think when we think about sort of the young people we see, which is about 15 to 1600 young people a year. We sleep about 400 to 450 a night in a variety of housing or shelter options. And importantly, young people need housing, but they also need education and employment support and behavioral health support. And they need support around education and all of the things, right? The most common driver or co what, what correlates most with homelessness for young people is not having a high school diploma or a GED. And when we think about the impacts of the past several years around the pandemic and school, like what we are seeing and worried about is like, who who will be our next, who who now will experience homelessness if they don't, if they didn't complete high school and they don't have access into the labor market. So we just asked a question about the root causes. What do you think are the main contributors to youth ending up homeless? And we had um, w w in our responses, the, the highest response is challenging. The challenges of just growing up, of being a young person, uh, peer pressure, rejection by family and so on. And then we also had uh, two other answers, instability and poverty, uh, lack of jobs and so on, and then mental health, substance use, various types of behavioral issues. And where, what do you think is the leading driver of, of housing insecurity among youth, among young people? The yeah. leading driver, if you chose one. Uh, that's a tough question to choose one, but uh, Sherilyn sort of touched on, on this. And it is, uh, what I would say is that homelessness amongst young people uh, is not equal among all groups. And that is a result of uh, discrimination, systemic racism and homophobia and transphobia, uh, because we know that LGBTQ uh, young adults are more than twice as likely to experience homelessness as their non-LGBTQ peers. And if, and it's intersectional. So a black LGBTQ young person, especially a male, has the highest rates of homelessness amongst young people experiencing homelessness. So while it's hard to, to say exactly one thing, and Sherilyn was exactly right about, um, about education and, uh, and the, the, the impact of a lack of a high school diploma, uh, I do think that you actually have to, to, to look to that intersectional discrimination and racism as, as the leading factor. Let's let's take a look at this inter intersectionality. These th these various um, issues that we we describe with the um, ambiguous umbrella of systemic, right? Aren't we talking about a whole bunch of very subtle factors, sometimes obvious, where we just we we we've just seen uh, tremendous violence uh, perpetrated um, in. Um, in Colorado, um, targeting uh, an LGBTQ plus uh, community uh, gathering place. 
But very often, it seems like there are additive, subtle uh, elements that when it hits an individual, those are so additive that they really end up uh, posing a, a mountainous uh, hill to climb, particularly if you don't already have any family wealth, you don't already have an educational foundation, you don't have uh, the kind of sophisticated emotional support um, or medical uh, support that, that money can buy, right? Um, Renisha, when you're trying to heal that, that's a huge mountain for any youth to climb. How can a small nonprofit with a modest budget uh, make a real life-changing contribution to a young person? It's, it's great that you're supplying the immediate need. It's absolutely essential. How do you change that? Because, you know, these, ki- th- these young people, I don't want to call them kids. They, they're young adults. They sometimes have, ch- have children themselves. It's a 10, 20-year journey to that independence. Um, how do you do that? And how do you multiply that by 700 or, you know, 10,000 or, or 4.2 million? Yeah, it, it is definitely a challenge um, and it is a, a process. Um, I think we, you know, first always start being trauma-informed, start with being able to address the basic needs Um, And to, one, create an environment that becomes a sanctuary and a safe place. And we try to make young people feel safe. Um, First, create safety, right? First, deal with the basic need. That's that's your first principle. Deal with the basic needs in um, the immediate crisis. Um, If we can bring them into an environment where their basic needs are met, Um, where we can address the immediate crisis or a sense of, um, you know, insecurity, then we can begin to open some doors to addressing um, longstanding trauma, whether that is um, individual experience of trauma um, and or whether that is community level, community level violence, um, poverty, experience of poverty and, and chronic adversity. Um, or if it, as, as you talked about, this accumulation, um, these additives of um, more structural racism um, in, at a societal level um, and, and all of that, right? Because it all is an interplay. I think as Anne talked about looking at these intersections and understanding the intersection, the intersectionality of, you know, these young people's lives and how that contributes to their um, lack of housing, stability, and security, I think that begins to open some doors for us to start the healing process. And with a lot of mental health um, resources, that's absolutely something that we found is critical to our program, um, our overall program and the services that we provide. Um, All of our young people are immediately assessed Um, And we continue to provide case management and mental health support services throughout their time with us because we understand. I have a question for you. To what extent do you hold the young person themselves accountable for taking charge of their own life? I've, I've heard very often two different views, which I suspect neither of them are are correct. One is to, uh, put foist responsibility on the on the person itself, particularly if they're adults. And the other is to foist responsibility just on general society. To what extent are you navigating these two extremes and where do you end up uh, in terms of personal responsibility um, and the help that you provide? How do, how do you talk about this internal to your environment? And Sherilyn, I'd love to have you also weigh in on this. How do you how do you talk with your clients and your and amongst your staff about about that idea? Yeah, I think it's a part of it. I think that you know certainly we talk a lot about choice um, and taking responsibility for your future, um, not necessarily taking responsibility for what has happened to you, um, and and that I think is important to stress that things happen to our young people often that they are labeled as bad um, and that 
quite often we dismiss the trauma that they have experienced and that has been inflicted upon them. And so, you know, we talk less about the the responsibility of what has happened. And we talk more about the choices that they can make now with the supportive services that we provide and the choice that they can make for their future moving forward. And that it is a process and we will still wrap around all the supports um, around them um, and they can take more responsibility for their actions and their future moving forward. Be informed by your past, but not held hostage to it. Yeah, I I think that is uh, exactly true, Renisha, exactly what how I would have answered that question. That um, You know, I think there's a lot of blaming of people experiencing homelessness or young people in particular of experiencing homeless, like they must have done something wrong. And I think that is just wholly un that's just and self blame right right yeah Charlotte? yeah for sure right i think i think yeah i think young people feel the stigma that is hoisted on them by others um but look you know there is no reason that any young person that walks into larkin street should trust anyone based on the kinds of experiences they have had like trauma led often to their experience of homelessness or housing instability. And then there's a bunch of trauma that happens if you are having to live outside or make untenable choices about staying someplace so you can at least be inside. So change happens at the speed of trust. It takes time. Young people have agency. They have the ability, you know, they are experts in their own experience. They have hopes and dreams and desires. And it is our job to see them, to support them, and to to provide opportunities. Housing solves homelessness, but housing alone doesn't address homelessness. Lots of different kinds of housing for young people and seeing them as and, and providing all of the opportunities to build, to gain the skills and, and tools that they'll need to, to you know, go on forever to not re-experience homelessness, right? They need the same things that my kid needs in order to be able to to be self-sustaining. And that takes a whole bunch of services, but it also takes somebody seeing them for who they are, believing in their potential and capacity and trusting them. But they have no reason to trust us initially. How do you navigate this, this issue of trust? Because when somebody comes in and they've been that they've experienced a lot that causes them to distrust. Now, your environment is staffed by people too. People can act as helpers. They could also act as abusers. How do you ensure that your approach is, and, and your people are part of a safety network that 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 idea of safety is conveyed, but also ensured by back office operations, where you're investigating uh, people who are coming seeking employment, providing these direct services. Sherilyn, why don't, we're going to go back, Sherilyn, and then Renisha, and then Anne. We uh, we'd like to talk about the sector and ensuring because we've we've heard about some abuses that have taken place. Um, within this th- this field of play, uh, Sherilyn, how do you ensure operationally as as a leader of of Larkin Street that your people um, actually are equipped and properly monitored to ensure the safety of your youth? Yeah, thanks. I think uh, well, a couple of different things, right? We have a pretty rigorous hiring process, and we all do the kinds of. Um, interviews and time like you know all about when you're trying to do everybody on this call might know how we do a background you know like not you know for for some positions there's a more extensive background to uh, check uh, but really working with folks on hiring making sure that folks are trained right i think it's really important to understand that in this sector we often have paid really low wages we often have had really high caseloads We often have not been able to invest in the kinds of training and support and professional development because of the way that we're funded. So what we do at Larkin Street, we have a professional development team. We work really hard to push our city to increase wages for our staff so they're not precariously perched on homelessness. We have a trauma-informed approach. 
we understand that the staff are want, are vital to the success of young people. And so we invest in them in the ways that we can, and we push for greater understanding of the challenges and stressors that our staff face in the provision of services. Uh, to young people. So, you know, we do all the things around hiring and then we get good people in and then we tr we do our very best to support them with training and professional development, fight for better wages for them. Um, and, you know, we have processes for young people to express to us if things aren't going well, right? Like you can finally, you know, if there's something not working, there's a, a real transparent process for you to tell us about that so we can address it. So you're creating threads of trust so that you're not just requiring somebody to trust one person who is providing. If they have feedback, Renisha, you have various threads that allow that feedback to happen. And then you can create a response instantaneously to that feedback. How does that work over at Covenant House? Yeah, absolutely. Everything um, I think that Sherilyn has, has outlined, um, we have in place um, being a part of a sort of federation of Covenant House sites across across the U.S., Central America, and Canada, we also have other resources that um, other human resources that allow us to add layers um, of the accountability, right, for our staff to our young people, and for there to be avenues for young people and for other staff um, to report. Um, if there is any abuse, um, abuse of power, um, discrimination, um, or any act that is uh, not aligned with the mission and the values of Covenant House um, as a federation of sites and also Covenant House New Orleans specifically. Um, and we stay true to that. And when, you know, there if there is an incident that gets immediately reported and there are channels for um young people and staff uh, to report and to make sure that that funnels to all of the right um, people. And you take um, so concerted action, right? I mean, you're, we not, take action. you're not, you're not right. stringing it out. You take concerted action. Okay. And we take uh, concerted action. And, and just to emphasize again, I think the professional development piece and training that happening on an ongoing basis is critically important. And to make sure that our staff are in tune with trends. Um, so as we learn what's happening in New Orleans and what's happening um, with respect to youth who in housing insecurity across the country, that our staff are in tune with that um, and are able to develop uh, an organizational response. Um, and that translate at an operational level um, in how we implement our programs and how we function on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm going to give you the last word since we're coming to the end of our time. I want to I want to point out uh, that we we've asked a couple of other questions. Um, one was, do you know anybody who's homelessness who's homeless? And we got a a uh, 45 to uh, 55 percent response. 55 uh, percent of the people said yes, which is not unusual for this type of a topic. Uh, there were a lot of people who said no. Um, one of the things that that we would urge is think about your wider circle, because it's almost certain no matter what your economic level, no matter what part of the country you're living in, no matter if it's rural, suburban, or a city, you are coming into contact daily with people who are homeless or whose your own family might have, have suffered this. Uh, your friends, your, their wider circle might have suffered it. So part of this is an awareness issue. But Anne, I have another question for you, which is, in the National Alliance Tens and Homelessness, you have the need for an all-in kind of a approach in which uh, business, real estate developers, nonprofits, churches, government, everybody needs to be part of this solution. How do you forge those relationships so that people can find a way to be involved by their own lights in solving the problem? How do you how do you look at this as as an all in kind of a a problem that people can actually participate in solving as a country? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the the so I also want to note that not only am I the CEO of the National Alliance to End Homelessness, I'm the board chair of True Colors United, 
which is uh, an organization, a national organization uh, dedicated to ending homelessness among LGBTQ young people. And so when I look at, when I answer that question, um, I look at both of the, both of my uh, hats in, in this area. And I would say it's really about relationship building. Primarily it is relationship building and listening to young people and understanding what they want and need and understanding their experiences and having uh, tables where you are including young people in discussions and in decision-making with all of those other sectors that you just talked about, whether it be government, whether it be um, members of Congress, whether it is our um, uh, faith-based partners, um, all of those folks actually need to hear from young people. My own, ex my own life experience doesn't, can't get across the, the kind of information and expertise that young people bring to the table. So that is my the primary way that we uh, try to build community and really build towards um, an end of youth homelessness. We also partner with, with folks like we have on the screen today to make sure that um, we understand what they're seeing locally so that we can build a national uh, framework to, to end youth homelessness. So it's listening, it's listening, it's being informed by people recognizing that their experience also gives them expertise. Right, Renisha? Right, Sherilyn? Right? That the expertise that people can bring to the table to solve the problem that they themselves are experiencing is part of this. And having people of different lived uh, uh, experiences share and develop solutions together is, is a part of your calculus, Anne. That's right. But it's not just function. listening. It is also sharing power, bringing people to the table as partners. Making making the contribution that you can make to solving a problem, a very important idea that we should all be informed by. Anna Oliva, Executive Director of the National Alliance and Homelessness, Renisha Robertson, Executive Director of Covenant House in New Orleans, and Sherilyn Adams, Executive Director of Larkin Street Youth Services in San Francisco. Please Thank everyone in your uh, on your staff, on your boards, your volunteers, your clients who are part of our solution. And please thank uh, your donors and those who allow you to continue operating within your municipalities and environments. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to wish everybody a, a wonderful Thanksgiving and holiday season. We're going to take a bit of a hiatus on the show um, uh, for a bit, but we will be back in the new year and helping you to ensure that Americans all across the country are involved in solving these really important problems to make this country a better place to live. Thank you. Thank you.